Hi, everybody, and welcome to another session in our Women Lead online forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today, and today we have a subject matter expert in the hot seat who was really willing to say, yeah, go ahead, ask me anything. Now, our session today lasts for just under an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. This is not intended to be a one-sided conversation. It's a discussion where you are invited to ask anything that you would like to ask of our subject matter smarty pants here. And if you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to share it for you. So our topic today is financial smarts for women. And as we started looking at this topic, especially in light of everything that's going on right now, uh, we wanted to take a closer look at what are some things that, that women ought to be considering right now. I mean, a woman's investment strategy should be based on unique realities that we face. But right now, things might need a little bit of an adjustment. And so I'm so excited to introduce today's subject matter expert, Maureen Shop. And let me tell you a little bit about her. So Maureen is a certified financial planner professional who works alongside her clients to obtain financial fitness by identifying their financial goals, um, gain understanding of what's most important to them, and then implement a holistic strategy to wealth management management by looking at both sides of the balance sheet. I think that term holistic strategy is so important because every individual's needs are different. And as a certified financial planner with, with Merrill Lynch Wealth Management, this is what she does with her clients. And especially right now, I think it's so important that we have an expert help calm our fears in this crazy, turbulent, very fluid time. So without further ado, I'm so happy to hand this over to our resident subject matter expert, Maureen Tishop. Thanks, Maureen. Take it over. And my name is Maureen Shop, and I uh, run a wealth management practice at Merrill Lynch. My partner and I uh, uh, manage about $500 million in assets. Uh, and there are five um, individuals on our team, uh, three advisors and two assistants. And the cornerstone of our wealth management practice, as Patty mentioned, is financial planning. Um, oftentimes, uh, someone will come to me and they have accumulated a sum of money and they ask me, okay, what, you know, how should I invest this money? Well, you know, the, the answer I give them is, I don't know, you know, until I really understand what your goals are for the funds, uh, what your goals and priorities are when it comes to your finances, um, and until we actually can put, uh, gather all the information and put together a financial plan, a holistic financial plan, uh, where we look at both your assets and your liabilities, as well as your goals and your time horizon, I can't really answer that. So once we put the financial plan together, it gives us a roadmap to really the advice that we need to be providing, what we need to be doing with that portfolio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because what's gonna work for me is not necessarily the same thing that's gonna work for Monique or for Lori or anybody else, because we've all got different unique characteristics. You know, we've all got a different um, earning horizons, um, you know, all, all of that kind of thing, right? Right, and we take that all into consideration, you know, mm -hmm. how long uh, your time horizon, which means how long uh, you have until you need to access the money, you know, what's your comfort level of, is with risk, you know, are you married, are you single, what are your sources of income now, what are your sources of income going to be if and when you do retire, mm -hmm. we, you know, really go in depth as to um, what your goals and priorities are. Yeah. You know, right now you might have, you know, um, children in college, so that might be an immediate expense that we need to plan for. Um, but the majority of uh, financial plans that we put together, definitely retirement is on the horizon, is down the road. Mm -hmm. Right. So right now, um, 
I'm sure that some people are going, oh my gosh, what's happening to my 401k? What's happening to my IRA? What's happening to my pension? If, if anybody is lucky enough to have a pension. <laughs> I remember those days when people had pensions, right? Yes. <laughs> so have you seen this before? Have you seen a situation like this before? So um, we've definitely, you know, seen the market drop in the past here in the United States, um, 30, 40, sometimes 50%. We mm -hmm. saw back in uh, from 2000 to 2002. Uh, and most recently, I'm sure everyone can remember uh, 2008 and 2009. Yeah. And, um, you know, this does happen from time to time, you know, drops in the market. Um, it definitely doesn't feel good. Um, but bear what we call a bear market or market corrections are a normal part of um, the investment process. Mm -hmm. So what do you say to people when, when they call you and say, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh well, my God. I, yeah, I try to um, look at the, uh, the bigger picture. Yes, this has happened before. And did the market recover? Um, yes, 100% of the time, the market's always recovered. Mm -hmm. And then about 12 months. Um, of course, you know, this circumstance is a little a bit different than what we've experienced in the past, but there's always uh, different uh, circumstances surrounding um, a bear market. You know, sometimes, last time it was the housing market. Um, before that, it was um, technology. Uh, before that, it was media. Before that, it was telecom. There's always sort of something going on. You know, history doesn't repeat itself exactly. <laughs> but it does cause um, a lot of, so this situation was the coronavirus. Right. And uh, what we saw uh, in the middle of March was basically a lot of uncertainty, which called, uh, caused a lot of panic and fear. Um, so, you know, people were panicking about what was gonna happen uh, surrounding uh, the virus and the overall macroeconomic uh, you know, environment, and basically the global shutdown. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of fear, panic, and uncertainty. So I was very happy to see that the, both the Democrats and the Republicans came together and put together um, a stimulus package, which is really what we needed to see. So once they implement, uh, introduced that uh, and agreed on that, we did see the market stabilize. So that's an interesting point. And, and any of you that are on online, please just jump in, join this conversation. Um, but you know, you get, uh, you get this kind of a tug of war, like, um, oh my gosh, that's a whole ton of money. Now that's, that's a huge debt that the country is taking on, you know, to infuse this cash into the, into the system, into the pipeline. Can you explain why that works why why that is was the thing to do and and how do we recover from that uh, you know it in it is a, a large sum of money um but the government has unlimited tools to backstop the economy mm -hmm. uh, so this is just one tool that they've used um and what they've done is you know Right now, we're seeing an unprecedented number of unemployment claims. And no fault to any of the uh, workers out there. They were just doing their job as they did day in and day out. And through no fault of theirs, they, you know, uh, the, we, the economy has been shut down. So the government had to step in to help, uh, you know, the, the consumer. Mm -hmm. 80% of gross domestic product is consumer consumption. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the government definitely needed to step in. And what they've done is provided liquidity. So um, companies that, you know, um, have payroll to meet. And so they're providing very, very low interest loans, not grants, but very, uh, very easy, accessible lending to um, bridge the gap during this, this uh, time where we've shut down the economy and nobody can go to work and 
you know, nobody's uh, producing what, what we normally produce. So they've mm -hmm. added a lot of liquidity to um, companies, big, uh, big companies, small companies, as well as the consumer to get some uh, cash back into our pockets so we can continue to pay our bills um, because it's a ripple effect. If, if we can't pay our bills, then, you know, if you can't pay your mortgage, then the mortgage-backed securities and the investments, so it's just a ripple effect. So if they can, uh, what they've done is been able to backstop the economy from further decline. Um, again, they have additional tools that they can use. Um, it is a large sum of money. We don't know what the long-term effects will be, but this is the right thing to do to bridge this gap right now. Mm -hmm. Maureen, you said that that, that that did level out the market. I didn't realize that. So it didn't really, it just stopped the decline. Is that right? Well, what it did is put confidence back into the investor. Um, again, and we saw the market decline 20, 30% within several days. It was um, part, uh, the majority of it was fear and panic of the uncertainty, but also there's now these algorithmic computers that once they uh, once the market reaches a certain level they just start selling off so it's not even it a lot of its fear and uncertainty but um, a lot of it's not even um, the investor selling out it's these computer models and these algorithms that just sell out and cause that's why we saw such a steep sharp drop is because these algorithms have come into play and, and reach certain levels, and they started the big sell-off. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, to, your, uh, to answer your question, uh, yeah, when, when the uh, Democrats and the Republicans came together as a united front and they put together the stimulus package, you know, there, now there's some hope for the, the individual consumers, the small business owners, the big corporations, um, so it's definitely what, what we needed to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't realize that, that there was, there was actually automation that, that jumped into that. And then I would assume at some point there's a, a human interference in that to stop it. Or, um, I mean, I, this, this is not something I'm, I'm aware of at all. So how does that happen when you see that model begin to start selling off stuff? Well, then, uh, and then it just feeds into, um, you know, the ind individual investors making those decisions, mm -hmm. um, not really looking at the long term, uh, you know, not thinking long term, looking, looking at it very short sighted. And that's when uh, people start to panic. And that's when uh, we, that's when we as investors can make mistakes. So it's, that's why it's so important to have a strategy. Um, you know, a, a long-term strategy with, that includes short-term goals as well as long-term goals so that if something like this happens, you have, um, you know, hopefully you've put a, a strategy and a plan together to get you through these tough times. Mm -hmm. So what about recovery? Like how long do you think it takes? And this is probably a dumb question because it probably the answer is it depends. But for an investor to maybe recover, what they may have lost during a time like this. How, what should they plan for or, or what should they do? Someone who looks at their, their accounts and sees that there's just this huge slide, what, what should they do? Yeah, I get, I get that quite a bit when talking to my clients, what should they do? And, you know, um, there's basically the three fundamentals of investing, which is asset allocation, diversification and rebalancing. Mm -hmm. So asset went, so the first is asset allocation. What is your comfort level with risk? If you were a on a scale of one to five, one being very conservative and five being aggressive, if you're a three, a moderate investor and you see a big decline with the markets dropping, um, you know, it's really best to have, if you've put together a, a diver, diversified portfolio, it's best to just stay the course and ride this out because um, it'll, uh, you know, we've seen in all market declines that the market will recover, usually within about 12 months. 
Now, the big question is right now with our current, um, this uh, current coronavirus situation is we don't know when we can start to see recovery. Uh, we are estimating um, uh, second quarter of 2020 to have a negative 30% in GDP. We probably will see uh, it flat in the third quarter of this year. And hopefully if the, if the virus is abate and we, we have a little more control over the spread of the virus and um, hopefully in, in Q4, the fourth quarter of this year, we'll start to see a little bit of recovery. And if it doesn't happen in Q4, definitely in 2021, uh, we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, a, a big recovery. Hmm. So um, basically, you know, the advice I give my clients is, we, you know, you have your short-term sort of, I, the way I look at it is more like your buckets, your short-term buckets, your medium-term buckets, and your long-term buckets. Mm -hmm. Long-term bucket, you know, uh, that, it, you, uh, you know, depending on your time horizon, how long you're going to have until you need to access those, basically 401k, IRAs, retirement funds, SEP IRAs. Um, that's long term. Just let it ride. I, I would, you know, the best thing is to not look at your balance. <laughs> your balance, and we've already seen, you know, a ten percent recovery since since we hit bottom. Yeah. So already, you know, your balance today is already going to be better than your March end statement. Mm -hmm. You know, you should have a short term bucket. Um, I always recommend uh, in a proper financial plan if if you have one breadwinner in the home. You should have at least a six month emergency fund in cash in a liquid savings account at the bank that you can access for these exactly what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. These times where employment income might be jeopardized. Mm -hmm. Get you through your living, uh, you know, your living expenses for the next six months. If you have two sources of income and uh, three months of, um, you know, uh, an emergency fund or, or liquid cash. Um, so, you know, depending on the different uh, buckets, if, if you don't need the money, stay the course. Hopefully you have, um, the you know, an asset allocation that you're comfortable with. Um, and then the diversification. And with diversification, we really want to, uh, you know, with the, with the different investments that you do own, we really it not only prior to uh, this pandemic, but, you know, we really stress really good quality investments mm -hmm. in uh, good solid companies, um, you know, whether it's on the stock side or the bond side, really quality is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Maureen, um, if, if you had, um you know, I know you don't want to sell because everything's low right now, but I'm, I'm uh, in a situation where I'm taking a certain amount out every month to, mm -hmm. to supplement my, and I have been, it's pretty, you know, regular, but I mean, would you recommend somebody to, you know, try to um, not sell as much because the market is low? So if I'm getting a certain amount a month, if I could you know, cut back at this point to cut it down. Is that something you would recommend? Or you've already said stay the course, but I'm just, you know, just kind of, would you recommend to a client uh, to s try not to take as much out a month if you can? Right. So in your particular situation, if you're, which, if you had been withdrawing a certain dollar amount on a regular basis and you're going to continue withdrawing a certain amount on a regular basis, if you compare that back during a, a you know a market low, um, if you if you are are able to, you know we have fixed expenses and we have variable expenses. Mm -hmm. um, we, we wouldn't be able to cut back on any of the fixed expenses, but you know you might be able to look at some of the variable expenses and cut back on those. If you're able to now, would be definitely a good time uh, to do that. Um, and uh, as far as the, the amount that you need to withdraw. I would um, recommend that you liquidate only what you need for that particular month mm -hmm. or, you know, I don't know how often you're taking uh, withdrawals, but let's say um, on a monthly basis, what you need for that month. 
let the, let it, uh, let the rest continue to be invested and uh, hopefully the market will ra rally and you, and you can recoup some of those losses um, but right. take, uh, you know uh, take what you need um, to get you through right now that's that would be my recommendation for your particular yeah yeah okay sense? good yeah because I was I've uh, it, the funny thing is like you said the variable expenses I you know golf and bowling and going out to dinner and movies all that's gone so uh -huh. so it's easy to see that you could have some excess money that you maybe didn't have before yeah. but then the income's not there either so mm -hmm. right yeah, so just try, be a little more conservative with liquidating right now um, until, you know, as long as, it, as long as you're comfortable, you know, we don't, I wouldn't recommend anybody doing anything where, you know, you're, you're stretching yourself a little too thin. We want to be, make sure you're healthy and comfortable and, and, uh, you know, not only your, your uh, physical health, but your mental health as well. So we want to make sure we're making thoughtful decisions during this time. You know, conversely, is this a good time? Because we are, like Lori said, we're not golfing, we're not bowling, we're not going to the movies, we're not going out to eat, we're not doing any of those kinds of things. Is this a good time to maybe start investing more? Look, you know, working with somebody about where, where should I be putting some more money at this point? Yeah, so with the decline in the market, it does, um, provide a, a nice entry point uh, where, um, you know, investments are, are generally a little less expensive than they were even two months ago. Mm -hmm. I would go back to the total financial plan. Mm -hmm. um, if you have that three to six month emergency fund in cash, then anything on top of that, you're really not keeping up with inflation. So that's money that could be invested um, and you want to make sure, you know, if you have, or you're self-employed um, business owners, as I'm sure a lot of you are, whether you have a, like a solo 401k, a 401k for your business and your employees, or your a SEP IRA, a simple plan, there's a lot of plans for um, businesses. Make sure you're, um, you know, if you have a little bit of extra cash flow on top of that emergency fund, Make sure you're maxing out those contributions. Mm -hmm. And once you've done those two things, you've funded the emergency fund, you've you're maxing out whatever retirement plan you have in place, then you could take that uh, extra spending money that you would have normally spent on eating out or uh, golf. Um, take that money, and and you it would be a good time to invest in, um, you know variety of different opportunities that are going to fare well during a recession period and also maybe um, there's some definitely some good investments where uh, you know we call this disruption disruptive which is not a negative thing but a way of doing business so yeah. some disruptive technologies uh, you know stocks that specialize in the disruptive technologies which will fare uh, really well through the recession and beyond this once we're on the other side. Yeah, that's good. Any, uh, any Maureen, like, may, like maybe jigsaw puzzle companies. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> that's true, you know. Any kind of internet, you know, um, uh, type of companies, those are doing really well right now. Consumer staples, which are, you know, groceries and uh, toilet paper, paper towels, those companies are going to be doing really well uh, through this and through the recession that we're going to be. Uh, Marina, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh-huh. So, um, the first one is if I have liquid cash for the savings, um, it, where would you recommend to put it aside from just a plain savings account? that you want to have liquid cash? Is there some other options that are better? Um, this that's my first question. Uh, my second question is, as a, it might be a stupid question, so I apologize. I'm a self-employed, I'm, I'm sole proprietor, it's just me. Okay. What would you, so I don't have a 401k. Okay. What would you recommend, like bare bones, where, where, where to start? Like I have 
my liquid cash for savings for emergencies that I have. Right. Um, but aside from that, where would you recommend to start? And you, you sound very knowledgeable, but everything you're saying is like, it doesn't make sense to me. Like it doesn't mean anything to me because I'm, I'm not, I, I feel like you only deal with big companies that are making, you know, six fig, fig figures and up. So those are my two questions. Yeah. Well, uh, so our, you know, my wealth management practice, we, we specialize in small business owners, individuals and families and retirement is an area of expertise that we have. And so for your particular situation, your, uh, regarding your first question about the liquid savings, I would recommend, um, you know, a, a bank money market account. And if, if you're able to, um, you know, with a very low, we have, we're in a very low interest rate environment, but there are money market accounts that could pay a little more yield. So, you know, you could shop around for um, a money market with a little bit higher yield. And then the second uh, option would be CDs. Um, if you have a liquid, say, uh, enough li in a liquid savings account, what I would recommend if you're interested in uh, purchasing CDs, because those are FDIC insured, there's basically no risk to um, buying a CD, would be to ladder those CDs. And what I mean by that is, let's say you had, let's, let's say for example, you had uh, $30,000 in a liquid savings account. So you would ladder, you would have maybe 10,000 liquid. So you, if you needed access to it, you have access to it right away. And maybe put 10,000 in, you know, a one or two month short term CD if it's gonna get a little bit better yield. And then another 10,000 in maybe a six month CD. Mm -hmm. So that um, if you do have a need for that cash, you know that that money is going to be maturing and you're going to have access to it. You just don't want to tie your liquid savings up for anything longer than uh, six months. But that's a strategy to get a little, to earn a little bit better yield than what um, on the average money market funds are paying. Right. Mm -hmm. What about a Roth IRA? Is that something also because it's you're putting it in after tax dollars, so it's more accessible to you, but I don't know how it compares interest rate wise, you know. Right, so um, the Roth IRA would be the um, umbrella of what type of account you would uh, could put the money into. Mm -hmm. For 50 and under, you can put $6,000 a year, and if you're over 50, it's $7,000, so those are the same as, um, same, contribution uh, limits as a traditional IRA. Now, the uh, caveat with the uh, Roth IRA is you do have, there's income limitations. So, uh, so depending on what your adjusted gross income is, uh, you could, you know, it depends on whether you can put money into a Roth. Now, if you are eligible to fund a Roth IRA, you can fund a Roth IRA in many different uh, instruments. And what I mean by that is you can open a Roth IRA at the bank and put it into a CD, which is very safe. Or you could open a Roth IRA with someone like me at Merrill Lynch, and we could invest that money into the stock market if, um, you know, if you wanted to see that money grow a little faster. Mm -hmm. uh, what's nice about the Roth IRA is that you can withdraw your contributions without any kind of penalty. Um, you do have to wait till 59 and a half to, uh, otherwise, uh, to get the earnings. Otherwise, you get penalized um, just like a traditional IRA mm -hmm. and penalty, but it's only on the earnings. Yeah, so it, that is a, a flexible way to um, fund retirement uh, with some liquid, uh, liquid cash. Um, it is, as long as you fall within those uh, income requirements. Mm -hmm. And then I think, uh, Monique, you had another question about what specifically for uh, sole proprietor uh, options you have if you wanted to, if you had extra cash on top of your liquid savings account to start uh, a retirement plan for you for, and for your business. 
You have a couple different options. There's first of all the traditional IRA, which again, if you're 50 and under, it's six, it's six thousand dollars a year, and over 50, you can contribute seven thousand. And again, you have options. You could do it at a bank, very conservative CDs type of thing, or you could also take that uh, traditional IRA and invest it in the market. Mm -hmm. um, the next step up would be what we call a uh, SEP IRA. And um, the SEP IRA would, is nice because you have much higher limits. Uh, depending on your income, you can contribute up to 52000 or 25% of your adjusted gross income into a SEP IRA. And again, the SEP can be, you can uh, open it up at a bank, very conservative, and have it be, stay very conservative as far as investments. Or you can open it up with a broker and invest that money for the long term in the stock market. Mm -hmm. Good, good questions. Yeah, so Monique, if you, you know, if you ever want to one-on-one, -on -one uh, you know, have a discussion, I'm, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about your particular situation offline, okay? Thank you. You know, when, when life goes back to normal, <laughs> and, and it will, um, what, what are some of those unique differences or challenges, I guess, that women face um, as versus what, what men face in, in investing? Right. So uh, women definitely um, have a different challenges than men do. Uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, women will most likely uh, leave the workplace um, about, you know, to either um, for, uh, their children, take care of their children, maybe take care of a spouse or take care of their uh, aging parents. Mm -hmm. We see just um, in general, women would take le uh, time out of the workforce which um, there is what we call a wealth gap due to that, because when we step out of the workforce, uh, you know, the time between the time we leave the workforce and go back, you know, um, our earnings potential probably has declined during that time, and especially the longer the duration, the more uh, effect it would have on your earning ability. Right. Um, but also your ability to save during that time. If you're working for a company, um, you know, during that time you take that gap from employment, you're not contributing to a 401k and you're not, you're not taking advantage of the match that the company provides. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as if you're self-employed, you know, you might not be um, saving as much for retirement. Um, the other, so there is a little bit of a, a, uh, a wealth gap between men and women. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing though with the millennial generation is the uh, income gap is um, getting smaller and smaller. So that's definitely, we're moving in the right direction. I do believe we still have quite a ways to go. Yeah. Another challenge women face is uh, you know, we, we tend to live longer. Um, so we have longevity. So planning for longevity is uh, really important as, as an overall financial plan. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and um, so, yeah, we definitely face uh, some challenges that are probably different than our male counterparts. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Just more good news, right? <laughs> So any other questions that, that y'all have while well, we've got uh, Maureen here with us? And I, I think that this is a such a turbulent time. It really is. And I know everybody is saying that, but, but it really is. And, you know, I remember back in 2008 and 2009 and um, the number of people that had to postpone retirement because of, of what had happened to their portfolio and or who retired and came back into the workforce you know so i think um any of us that remember that with great clarity because it wasn't that long ago can rightly feel you know a little you know a little trepidation right now so it's really helpful just to talk through this with someone who has been through these ups and downs and has weathered it and has 
you know, seeing what, what can happen in the market. Right. Yeah. And when yeah. it's an interesting, um, you know, women right now, the biggest transfer of wealth in the amount of about $2 trillion will be transferred to women. And, um, so what we found is that women often don't feel that financial institutions have really uh, catered to women, but we're making a change. We're really, you know, I myself being a woman, I really um, enjoy um, the education piece. I really try to educate not only my clients, um, but, but women in general on finances and investing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with providing education to women, we'll get, uh, women will be more confident in their ability to manage money because that, that, the, like I said, the transfer of wealth will be to women. So it's a great opportunity to really uh, understand what, uh, what options are there and how to put together you know, a proper financial plan to get you to meet, uh, to, uh, meet the goals uh, when it comes to your finances. Yeah, Good. yeah I, um, I have a funny have a story if, if we have time. <laughs> um, I started to work for IBM in 87 and we had, I think it was June of 87, so I'm now giving away my age, but um, IBM was really good about, you know, just in men and women, of course, educating us on, you know, planning for, even though I was quite young, it was like, okay, you need to plan for your retirement and things like that. And, but anyway, we, we had an option to get into an employee stock purchase plan. And my current manager at, when I started, didn't think that he thought I had to be there a year before I could start buying. And I went to a, like an employee orientation in October of 87. And they told me then, no, you, you're hired by July 1st, you get to start right away. So I filled out the paperwork while I was there. We had the big crash of the market in October of 87. So by the time my paperwork went in, um, everything, you know, everything was way down. When I started buying, I was buying at the lowest price the stock had been in some un unbelievable number of years. So I guess if we, you know, we could plan to start, if you're at that point in your life to start getting into the market, then maybe maybe January of 2021 might be the, the time to get in, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah. Or now. Maybe now is a good time to get in, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's low. Yeah. Yep. Buy that internet stock um, now. Marie. Go ahead, Monique. So, Maureen, I have a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Uh-huh common mistake that you see that women do when they're investing and that men don't do? What is the common mistake that you see? That's a good question. Yeah, that is a good question. You know, um, when the common mistake is, uh, you know, I'm going to have a little plug here, <laughs> is really um, trying to do it yourself. Uh, a lot of and, uh, you know, want to do it themselves and um, really to hire a professional to take care of your investments. You know, we're looking at uh, uh, professionals looking at the markets on a day-to-day -day basis. We're getting knowledge from uh, global, our global analysts from all over the world. Um, so hiring somebody to help you uh, put together a financial plan, manage your investments, really takes the burden off your plate. Uh, because I know uh, all of you as business owners, you're busy running your practice. So, you know, uh, running, uh, you know, your investments and having a budget and, and paying your bills, that's a full-time job. So, you know, a partnering with a, an investment professional I would say would be um, probably the best thing you could do. Okay, so that's something you see that men do more often than women. Um, I see b both men and women trying to um, do, you know, be do-it-yourselvers, and um, you know, if we, the, and they don't really have a strategy. 
Um, so having a strategy, having goals, and you, uh, having a plan that you uh, review on a regular basis as life change, as markets change, then you, we, we can re adjust accordingly. Mm -hmm. If you're uh, on your, uh, if you're meeting your goals, then, you know, we don't have to be as aggressive with your portfolio. But if you're not on target to meet your goals, then we either have to save more, we can take on maybe a little more risk with the portfolio, or you may have to work longer. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, having a plan in place, the way I look at a financial plan is almost like a GPS. And I know that sounds corny, but, you know, you're driving, let's say, from here to Los Angeles to go see a Lakers game back in the old days when, you know, we could go. <laughs> we were doing those types of things and you hit traffic well so you have to take a little bit of a detour and you know you eventually get there but you've you know had to adjust the the path that you were on well it's the same thing with a financial plan you know you want to get from point a to point b um oftentimes there's um roadblocks in your way market corrections maybe your ch uh, change in income so as your as uh you know change changes whether they're from yourself or from uh, things that are beyond your control, such as the market, then we make those adjustments. So definitely having a financial um, professional helping you guide you through it, then you're gonna see a lot more success being able to meet those financial goals of yours. Okay, and um, my second question is, what is the smallest amount a person or, or female can come in to to work with an investor like yourself and say, this is what I have, what can we do with it? What's the lowest amount you work with? Good question. So um, we, I do- what, Did you guys hear what I- Yeah, so I work, I do work in a team environment and I do have, so, um, you know, Merrill Lynch, basically our um, threshold is $250,000 in investable assets and above. And how we get to the $250,000, let's say it's a husband and wife, wife has $125,000, husband has $125,000, that makes, you know, eligible, $250,000 combined, then that couple would be eligible to work with um, myself. But I do have t a teammate who um, real, uh, specializes in the sub 250 space. So, any, so really any dollar amount, as little as $1,000 can get you started a, in the investment arena with Merrill Lynch. And, and that's with Merrill Lynch or is that something you have on the side? Uh, it's called, it, we have a platform called Merrill Edge. And so Merrill Edge, um, they specialize in the sub 250 space, but I do have a teammate on my team who specializes in those uh, types of accounts. For individuals who are just getting started into investing, you know, uh, some of maybe younger individuals or, um, you know, uh, if you're just starting out, we definitely have uh, those resources available and they're very cost effective. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the questions. Any other questions that folks have for, for Maureen? This is our, our chance to pick her brain. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> what so, would be your, your, your final words of wisdom, you know, to yeah. us? Or? So going into prior to this uh, pandemic, and go, go, uh, when we go, started the year off in the beginning of 2020, um, there's no, uh, so the fundamentals were strong. So uh, since 2008, you know, uh, companies have shored up their balance sheets. Banks have uh, higher reserve requirements than they did prior to uh, 2008. So fundamentals were really strong. We had a very low unemployment rate, interest rates that are all, all time low. So uh, by buying a home, very in, uh, you can borrow money very uh, inexpensively. Mm -hmm. uh, millennials uh, were starting are starting to uh, get married and form households, so that's going to be very good for the economy moving forward. You know, as they form households, they'll be buying homes and all the durable goods that go into uh, home purchasing. You know, refrigerators, washer and dryers, cars, and then of course they'll be forming families. So, um, you know, 
so the economy, the fundamental portion of the economy was very strong going into prior to this pandemic. And uh, so it was very different. So that it, it really, it was different than 2008 where uh, that was excess, a um, lot of- uh, Bloated, yeah. Right, so mm -hmm. that's, that's not what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with a black swan macro uh, event that, uh, you know, is, is uh, a global shutdown of production. And it's a little unprecedented. We haven't seen this. But as soon as the, um, we get an abatement of the virus, which we're, we're really try, uh, starting to see a little bit, a glimpse of light at the end of the tunnel uh, now. And, um, you know, it's probably going to be a rough ride in the second quarter, maybe into third quarter. But once we get past this, then uh, because the fundamentals were strong going into this, we're going to come out and everything will be fine. It's a little scary right now, but we are all in this together. The government um, is willing to do whatever it takes to backstop the economy. So, uh, you know, just hang in there and take care of your health, <laughs> both physically, mentally, and, uh, you know, stay the course, do, don't panic, don't make irrational decisions right now. Uh, think of the long term and uh, once we get past this, you know, we'll all look on this and, and I'm sure we'll all have learned quite a bit and grown quite a bit yeah. in different ways we never imagined. So, you know, I, 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 I remain, a, a, ho, a, I'm a constant optimist, <laughs> I'm always very optimistic. So even within um, the investment realm, I remain very optimistic because uh, things will get uh, improve and hopefully we'll get life back to normal, which I don't know if we'll ever see anything. It'll be a new normal. It'll be definitely looking yeah. different than uh, what, we, what we were experiencing prior to this pandemic. Yeah. Mm. All right. Any last questions from anybody? This has been super informative, and and I think it's been very encouraging. You know, and um, the sky isn't falling, <laughs> and, and, and we we will recover from this as we have in in other times before. So, I really want to thank you, Maureen, for taking the time. I want to thank everybody that joined us live, and and everybody that will listen to this in the replay as well. Be sure and share it with your friends if they're um, if they're feeling nervous. Say, oh man, you should have heard this brilliant woman that I heard today <laughs> speak about the markets and and what we've uh, what's what value we really have, what we've learned over the past, and and how that's going to see us through this time. So thank you again, Maureen. Thanks to all of you for joining me. Thanks for your great questions, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you guys. Another future Ask Me Anything. Take care. See you next time. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining and thank you Patty for having me.